Well, it's finally here. After a short detour to catch up on the game I forgot about, which was Kirby's Epic Yarn, we make it to one of the more major releases of the entire franchise, Return to Dreamland. For better or worse, Kirby has been one of those series that have been spinning more around the handheld than the console world of Nintendo. Probably par for the course with games in general, since handheld releases take less time to produce and are usually less full of content than their console counterparts, so this probably has something more to do with logistics than anything else. Plus, this could be said for a lot of Nintendo's stable mates, since pretty much all of them started out in that 2D space. Kirby's always been a solid platformer performer, so it's not like we're losing out on anything by visiting him more at the DS Cabana or the Game Boy Hideaway than at the Wii Park, but that also means that Return to Dreamland has to have something pretty special to show for itself to get a seat at the Dolphin Table, so what makes this game such a notable release to get a full-on dedicated Wii platform? Well, in the grand scheme and defying the laws of nostalgia, I have to say... Not much. Outside of a couple things that we'll talk about, it's actually really similar to Kirby Superstar. Simply put, Return to Dreamland is simply a great, solid Kirby experience and everything you would expect from HAL Labs' golden days. You get the solid cast, the regular copy abilities, the challenging and interesting platforming across the usual domains, the puzzle elements where you need to figure out particular opening skills to get to certain paths that contain your collectibles and healing fruit, the collectibles in this game being gears that you can collect to unlock permanent copy ability stations and Kirby's mini games to play after you're done with the campaign. It's all good and it's all here for the fans along with a new console cast of boss fight that'll have you facing weird gimmicks and dodgy combos. Bad. It's a good rogues gallery, pretty much on the line from the retro Donkey Kong games' boss lineup of being strange, unique, and difficult dudes to sort out once everything's said and done. In between all of that, you'll also be fighting another set of mini-bosses as well in Kirby's usual way, except with Sphere Doomer appearing 40% of the time, it seems like, and the rest being a cast of regulars, such as Bonkers. The big difference in why this game seemingly exists at all is that this was the first big push by the Kirby designers to introduce co-op into its playstyle, something that probably became more obvious to do after the big chaotic success of New Super Mario Bros. Wii, or Nasimbu for short. What? HAL decided to go big for its first at-bat with this new idea and decided that instead of starting in the shallow end at 2, they'd go for the big 4 and see how it turned out. Well, I guess they already did this with Kirby's Epic Yarn, I probably should have wrote that into this script. Well, anyway, considering that this feature stuck around on the console side ever since, I'd have to say that they chalked it up on the other side as a big W, and why the hell not? This feature not only was a slam dunk for Mario, but seeing as how some of these clips resemble Smash Brothers, it's the same template for victory if not just because HAL was also the studio developing the Subspace Emissaries platforming. You get the characters that you'd expect to pick from the start of this co-op project, Kirby, Meta Knight, DDD, and that one Waddle D that's important because he wears a bandana. Well, at least it's better than just getting to play as two different color toads for the entire thing. Later on in this franchise is when they'd start throwing in the kitchen sink and allowing you to play as regular enemies and some mini-bosses as well once the roster got full up. Good for them, because co-op platform might make progression a downhill struggle, it's still a ton of stupid fun dicking each other over and screwing around for an entire full-length Nintendo game. The other big change is that HAL decided to add a Giga-level mechanic to some of their copy abilities, which allows you to unleash screen nuke-level attacks at enemies throughout the game if you fill up a meter with stars or other collectibles, and that's a lot of fun to just throw out an attack that decimates anything and everything that's too unlucky to be directly in front of you at a moment's notice. The iconic one being Kirby's Giga Impact Sword, which comes up in the game's ultimate climax, and that's a crazy cool scene since HAL decided to throw in tons of production value to the game's final boss. One that actually feels built up and deserving of that kind of anime-level BS ending. Kirby also gets to enjoy that sort of power-up at his base level, since if he swallows enough or some bigger objects, then he's able to spit out giant cluster stars that can smash through barricades and enemies that are being a bit too distracting to our intrepid puffball on his way to saving Popstar one last time. The name of the game in Return to Dreamland is that Kirby's awoken from his perpetual vacation by a crashing starship called the Lore Star Cutter, piloted by a friendly alien that enlists Kirby and friends to fix his space boat by running around the planet and defeating the bosses that stole his craft's parts for some reason. 
I honestly have no idea why they'd steal wings and a sail, but I guess we don't really need the why, we just need the winds. So, with our new friend directing us on our journey, you go across the land, collecting the nuts and bolts, bring it all back, and apparently Magalore can't just have this one thing and go happily ever after. No, once he's back in his hometown, the Kirby gang gets tasked with yet another itty-bitty little thing to do to save the universe. There's a Dragon Guardian that has awoken from his eternity of slumber and is now destroying Magalore's home planet. He needs that gone so that... I don't know, Magalore can go back to tending his bean fields or whatever. Going over the final world of Magalore, the Kirby Bros defeat this terrifying four-headed dragonoid and can finally say that they did a job well done. That is, until Magalore pulls an unprecedented move and steals the dragon's crown in order to turn on the Kirby Bros as the real final villain of the game. This guy has been playing the Kirby gang like a fiddle this entire time since the real reason why he originally crash landed on Popstar was that he was trying to do this thing single-handedly with the lore star cutter and got his spherical butt handed to him by the dragon. His ship was fatally shot down by Landia and he managed to limp through a dimensional gateway that ended up with him on Popstar and then this whole thing went full circle. He knew that Kirby and friends would be easy marks to trick into doing his dirty work for him as long as he looked cute and adorable and so he could swoop in and take the master crown at the final moment, the object of ultimate power that he was always after since he knew Landia collected a lot of these sorts of things throughout his life's work. Well, goddammit, Kirby obviously can't have an unstoppable space magician on his doorstep now, can he? So we're off on our final, final job, kicking Magalore's teeth in. This final battle is quite a doozy compared to the rest of the franchise, not only going through multiple phases and tons of different attack patterns to deal with, including screen filling spikes and probably a grand old laser to throw in as well, getting to the point where Kirby needs to shatter his shield that Magalore surrounds himself with with his ultimate abilities that'll float through the battle as needed, finishing it off with the glorious Ultra Sword Combat Smash, shattering the whole thing and winning the day as he's destroyed. Until the crown itself revives Magalore as its vessel and continues a knockout, drag out match for the final victory, redoing a bunch of his original attacks and adding in some more screen nukes just to shake things up even more, as if we're not teetering on the edge already. Unfortunately for the cool in between of this fight, the final true showdown doesn't actually have a QTE esque finishing move and it's more just about knocking out his health until final victory. Magalore's corruption is defeated, the Master Crown is shattered completely, and finally, finally, period, Kirby and his mates can call this a job well done, all of space is safe once again, as Kirby can chalk this up as, what, his fifth space magician killed in his entire career? Return to Dreamland was a bombshell release for Kirby back in the day, bringing in proper big team developed levels that really haven't been seen since the golden days of Kirby Superstar, along with a new co-op idea that really did transform the way that people could play this game and most Kirby games in the future. Properly in single player or as a chaotic free-for-all in co-op play that did wonders for the way that people can perceive platformers as proper party pastimes. You get all the copy abilities and mini bosses that you expect along with a full new set of ideas that will provide you with the fun platforming combat that you come to expect from this developer. It's a beauty of a game that was wonderful detail and polish to the entire package and big feeling levels which were so great to see since each world in the game only came with four levels each as stock. That can be kind of a bit hit and miss if you're going with that little of levels. You do get a full suite of mini games to liven up the playtime with different experiences and what could be said about the plot itself which is what makes this game a standout in its franchise. It really wouldn't be much of a return if this wasn't included since the Magalore betrayal plot point does a lot more to make this game interesting than any revolutionizing level design will ever do. It's just true that story stands out a lot better than gameplay ever will. It definitely made Magalore a character to remember, just like Marx, because he did something different, a legitimate betrayal since Magalore looks like every other happy, flappy Kirby NPC until the very end when he tells you what his ultimate plan was the entire time he knew you, using the powers of Kirby to defeat his galactic rival for absolute power. That, along with Magalore's kick-ass and perfect difficulty final battle at the end, really made that a boss fight for the ages when it started incorporating level production value not seen a lot of the time and even in the Kirby's higher standards. 
Return to Dreamland with everything that you'd want in a Kirby game. The great platform and the detailed design, the great tunes, a new spin on it with the co-op design, some side games to do after the game's finished, and even an actual character arc. It's simply a phenomenal console release from the franchise and one of the times when Hal started pushing the envelope and doing things that were above our expectations. Definitely the game that should have been made for the franchises we release. Hopefully Hal won't be getting too sloppy once we start moving on to what they put out for the 3DS and the Wii U, whatever that might be. Check it out next time after we get back into the World War II trenches for our other franchise review. Oh, thank you guys for watching, and as always, have a victory for gamers because you all deserve it. Have a good night.